Hi, good morning. How are you guys doing today? Today is May the 28th, uh, day after Memorial Day. Hope that you had a good time with your family and your friends. Uh, Janet and I went out just for a little bit, but mostly just hung out and celebrated that day by resting and cleaning. So, <laughs> But anyway, we do have so much to be thankful for the country in which we live and um, thank God for the men and women who have lost their lives in service to our country so that we can uh, have the freedoms that we have today. So um, today uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter number 17. Last time we were together, we got down verses 1 and 2. And after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up to a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as light. So here we see the transfiguration. We talked about why did Jesus only take three of them? You know, why didn't he take the rest? Um, we're not sure. Maybe because these were the pillars uh, in the, the kingdom church. These were uh, the ones who certainly uh, were in the inner circle with our Lord. Uh, and then, you know, we mentioned the negative. Maybe these three lack faith and they needed to see it. <laughs> Um, the word transfiguration uh, means that Jesus begins to shine so brightly that it was difficult to look at him. And of course, we see Moses and Elijah appears uh, with him. And, uh, and we talked about how this is fulfillment of the last verse of the last chapter. It says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which will not taste death, until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I believe that 17 is, 17, 1 and 2, the transfiguration is fulfillment of that, that verse. Now, some people, you know, would disagree with that. But, I mean, it said, some of you standing here will not see death. They're all dead. <laughs> so, it could, couldn't have been much more future tense. I mean, they're dead. Peter, James, and John are no longer there uh, on this earth. Uh, they are with the Lord. So I believe that is the fulfillment of that. And of course you can, you can take option with that if you'd like. Uh, and then in verse, uh, three, uh, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah talking with him. So this is new territory. Why Moses and Elijah? Now some would contend that they represent, um, those who go to heaven. I think this is a little bit of a stretch uh, because if you look at these guys, um, how did they go to heaven? Well, let's see. In Jude chapter, in Jude verse number nine, it says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Um, Moses uh, died to get to heaven. He was buried. On the other hand, Elijah, if we look in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse number 11, it says, And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So some people would say, well, they represent how we're going to go to heaven. Some of us are going to die like Moses, and some of us are going to go up uh, in the rapture like Elijah. So, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, that could be there. <laughs> I mean, we do see the rapture, you know, in First Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. You know, the scripture says, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means those who died, you know, the Moseses, if you will, uh, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will go, will God bring with him, referring to those who died to go to heaven. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord, the Elijahs, if you will, shall not prevent them which are asleep, you know, the Moseses. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
the Moses, <laughs> referring to their bodies, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, the Elijahs, together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, you know, some people will break it down and just say it represents, you know, how people are going to get to heaven. Another, and I think this is much stronger uh, argument, is that these guys represent the fulfillment of the the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. Now, I think I'm going to hang my head on that one. <laughs> I think they represent the law and the prophets, and Jesus fulfilled both. You know, all Old Testament prophecy looked forward to the coming Messiah. Uh, the law was fulfilled in Christ. Uh, he said, I've not to come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So I think that would be my number one interpretation there. Uh, I think it's referred that they, these guys represent the fulfillment of the law. Now, this is also why these guys are considered to be the two witnesses, future in Revelation chapter uh, chapter 11, verses 3 through 13, because they came at his first advent, and they're going to come at his second advent. And of course, we know at the first advent, it could have been the first and only advent, had the Jewish nation repented and turned them to their Messiah, but they did not. So therefore, he's going to come yet again in future. Because if you look over Revelation chapter 11, uh, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, um, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days, clothed in sackcloth, three and a half years. And these are the two olive trees, um, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's back over in Zechariah. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds from their mouth. Now Elijah did that. You remember uh, when they were they when the people were sent to fetch him, the captains of the fifties. And devoureth their enemies, and and if any man hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So that's you know a flashback to how Elijah killed some folks. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Well, you know Elijah did that. Um, he was told you know the the rains were not going to come, and had power over the waters to turn them to blood. Well, we remember the plagues of Egypt and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Again, you know, that's a, you know, Moses did that. And when they shall have fulfilled their testimony, you know, um, the word testimony just means their, their life, you know, their, um, you know, a last will and testament, you know. Uh, when they fulfill their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. So we believe that at the during the tribulation period, after the rapture of the church, um, Moses and Elijah are going to come again. Uh, they're going to come, and then three and a half years later, our Lord is going to follow, but they're going to be his witnesses that go before him. You remember John the Baptist, we've said this already a few times, he could have been Elijah if you would have received him. Of course, you did not. You killed him, and you're going to seek to do the same to me. So, um, again, I think uh, verse number three, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And then in verse number four, uh, four through five. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So, in effect, Peter's statement about building three shrines was putting Jesus, I believe, on the same level as Moses and Elijah, which drew a rebuke uh, from God the Father. Um, why did Peter <laughs> make this suggestion? Why did Peter say that Jesus, um, why did he say, well, the Bible says he doesn't know why he said it. <laughs> In Mark chapter 9, it says, and Peter answered and said, Jesus, 
uh, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And again, this is just, you know, Mark's way of telling the story. Uh, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And in verse number nine, verse number six, because he did not know what to say <laughs> for they were greatly afraid. So, uh, Peter spoke before he thought. <laughs> um, so, um, again, I think the rebuke was drawn because he was putting, um, I, maybe because he was putting Jesus on the same level of Moses and Elijah. Uh, while Jesus is certainly better, Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. Or the Lord just, you know, just be quiet, Peter. Just listen. I got something to say and you don't need to be yapping right now. Uh, I can go with that theological interpretation as well. Uh, but most will point to the supremacy of Christ. You know, that Peter just failed to recognize that. Um, and then in verse number six, through eight and when the disciples heard it they fell on their face and were sore afraid and jesus came and touched them and said arise and be not afraid and when they lifted their eyes they saw no man save jesus only so the disciples of course referring to peter james and john i assume after the lord told them hear ye him stop talking um, they fell on their faces so obviously the apostles are reacting reacting in abject fear Getting rebuked uh, by God is probably not exactly on anyone's list for a way to start the day. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that uh, the Transfiguration um, served for many years to come as a reassurance to these apostles as to Jesus' true identity. And God certainly did use Peter, James, and John in a much greater way, at least as far as, you know, what we can see in the New Testament than he did the other guys. And maybe, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a cold today, but maybe the Lord realized these guys really just needed a glimpse be, behind the curtain uh, because of what they were going to go through as they lived out their life and their testimony uh, for the Lord. And then in verse number nine, uh, through 13, and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And the disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias or Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. Now, latch on to this, okay? It's very important. But I say to you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not. So he's obviously not referring to the transfiguration. He's going back and saying, Elijah's already came. And they received him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they wanted to. Likewise shall they also, the Son of Man. Uh, then the disciples understood that he spake to them of John the Baptist. So why do the prophets say that Elijah must come first? Or why do, what does it say? Why do... Um, and the disciples said, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And again, the Old Testament points this out in Malachi, Malachi, the Italian prophet, as I had a pastor friend call it. Um, in Malachi chapter 4, uh, it says the very last two verses of the book. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's Matthew 4, 5, and 6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So the, the Old Testament did say that Elijah would come first and, and of course our lord is saying here he has come it's just you guys rejected him 
when he came. So therefore, he's going to have to come again. Um, and then, in, and that's why we believe that one of the two witnesses is definitely Elijah. Um, and then in Matthew seventeen fourteen, and when they were come to the multitude, there came unto him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falls into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Now, this boy um, probably had epilepsy, um, which, you know, I mean, the symptoms are the same, uncontrollable movement. However, it is apparent also that there was demon possession involved. And of course, that does not imply uh, that everyone today who has epilepsy <laughs> is demonized. Is not saying that at all. Now, years ago, that's the way people interpreted it. And when people had those kind of involuntary muscle movements and things, they would interpret it as demon possession. But this boy obviously had epilepsy, and it was accompanied by uh, demonic possession. And notice it says that the disciples could not cure him. Now, look in verse 17 and look at our Lord's response. 17 through the remainder of the chapter. And then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer with you? In other words, put up with you. Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, We could not cast him out. Uh, and Jesus said unto them, Be because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, be hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So now Jesus does what his disciples could not. He further tells them that their unbelief is what hindered their ability to cast the demon out. Now, apparently in this case, they did not even have enough faith as of a mustard seed. Um, so apparently their faith was just not strong enough. And then Jesus comes and says, if you even had the faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you could have done this. So obviously their faith must have been severely lacking. And notice he says this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, most likely, the devil merely knew, now take note of this, the devil knew the extent of their faith and seceded it. He knew how much faith they had, and he went beyond that so that they didn't have enough faith to do it. Um, makes you wonder if the devil knows the extent of our faith and gets over on us because he goes beyond what faith we do have. Um, so, but if we have faith, even as the grain of a mustard seed, look what we can do. So you got to ask yourself, how much faith do we truly have? Uh, now surely these guys, I mean, they'd just seen the transfiguration, you know, and yet they didn't have enough faith, a grain of a mustard seed to cast out a demon. Um, uh, makes you wonder how poor our faith truly is. And I'll be the first to admit, Lord, help me in my unbelief, help me in my lack of faith. And then uh, the final two verses. And while he abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day will be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. This is another somber announcement for the disciples. And notice that the Lord offered them the bad news, but then he gave him the good news. He will be killed, but he will rise again. Of course, they still did not understand what he was truly saying to them. They didn't grasp it. They heard what they wanted to hear. They, they were not hearing crucifixion. They were not looking for a servant, uh, suffering servant. They were looking for a reigning Messiah. So anyway, chapter number 17. Next time we'll get down into, well, no, I still got uh, some more chapters. Um, I mean, some more verses. 
19 minutes. Okay, let's do that real quick. Verse number 24. And when they were coming to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? And he said, Well, yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take customs or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? And Peter saith unto him, um, of strangers. And Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. So what's going on? The questioning goes along these types of lines. Of whom do the kings of the earth take taxes? Do they take them from their own children? The answer is no. Kings don't tax their own children. They take them from strangers. So the conclusion is, if the king does not tax his own family, then the father would not tax the son since it is his own temple. <laughs> In other words, the Lord is saying, I don't owe taxes. My daddy's the king. <laughs> you, know? you know, God the father. Um, I mean, that's really what he's talking about there. And then verse number 27, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. Um, and again, I think Jesus was, you know, saying who I am. He was making a statement of who he is and who his father was. And his fathers don't exact taxes from their own children, especially in their own home. Uh, notwithstanding, lest we should offend these bozos, uh, go unto the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish, the first that cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for me and for thee. So notice, Jesus says, even though the previous being true, um, I see no reason to offend them. And bear in mind, they were already all over him, uh, and he didn't want to provoke them any further. He told Peter, go cast in your hook, and the first fish you catch, there'll be money there. Um, two things that I see there. Number one, Jesus didn't have any money. <laughs> Well, Jesus didn't have the money. His apostles didn't have the money. Uh, kind of flies in the face of a prosperity gospel. Um, well, the foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not place to lay his head. And you want what? I mean, you know, the prosperity gospel, I'm telling you, brother and sister, is garbage. It is not taught in scriptures. And the men that are teaching it are borderline heretics, and they're certainly hirelings. You need to get away from it. Um, and it's also just a little curious to me that Jesus would be concerned about offending them now. <laughs> I mean, he had already offended them uh, so many times. Um, but I think, again, he did not want to provoke the cross. He knew the cross was coming in its own timing. goes back to when he said, don't tell any man that I've done this, but they went out and did it anyway. He just didn't want to provoke them further. He really needed to make it back into Jerusalem of his own accord so that he could be betrayed into the hands of men and be, be crucified. Um, one final note there. Uh, I find it interesting that our Lord offended so many people. Uh, you know, we live in a culture where we just want to be politically correct and we don't offend anybody. Uh, we have become so soft. Uh, if the word of God offends you or if the word of God offends other people, so be it. Now, I don't think I should purposely go out and try to offend somebody. No, I'm not going to purposely go out and try to offend you. But if the word of God offends you, if the statement stating of the truth offends you, then so be it. I haven't offended you. The word of God offends you. Now, there's some Christians that are offensive. And it's not the word of God. It's them, themselves. They're provoking people. Um, but when you just speak truth and people are offended, that's called conviction. <laughs> right? I mean, that's called, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, going, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Uh, let them be offended. Let them land where it may. As a church, we need to start standing up and speaking the truth. We live in a day where nobody wants to deal with the truth. Nobody wants to call abortion murder. You see, they could get away with abortion for years before ultrasound came along the scene and before modern medicine came on the scene. 
Uh, they're killing babies. Over 98% of abortions, I read the statistic the other day, are of convenience. And they're calling it health care. It's not health care. It's murder. I got a better idea. Why don't you stop having sex? I got a, another concern. Why aren't we more concerned with fornication? Because that's what's leading to the majority of these. Because most pregnancies within marriage are wanted. So the vast majority of abortions that are taking place are single people who are out fornicating. Let the Bible speak. If it offends, let it offend. Let it land where it may. And you know the other societal issues that we're dealing with today. I mean, everybody wants to come out of the closet. Let me tell you something. The ones that need to come out of the closet are you and me, Christians. We need to come out of the daggone closet and start stating truth. And let it land where it may. Let the chips fall. And if it costs us something, it costs us. Because we're getting there, folks. We're getting there where we're going to have to start paying a price for what we believe. I was looking today on social media. Social media is starting to split. Let me tell you, I'm talking to you through YouTube. But most social media platforms are starting to push conservatives off of the off of the off of their platforms and we're going to have to find other platforms to express ourselves and that's just further and further tribalism that's dividing our country our country is in the middle of a civil war right now we just haven't shot at each other yet and i pray it doesn't come to that but teach the word of god let the chips fall where they may don't purposely offend people but speak the word amen God bless you guys. Hope that you have a great day. Remember, God loves you. He wants the best for you. He's working all things out for your good.